to Facebook Live Friday, the show that makes Bobby McFerrin worry. I'm your host, Todd Long. Let's welcome our guests. She's the Bonnie to my Clyde and the Jekyll to my Hyde. She's Amanda Kemp. Hi, Amanda. And this time, not in my ear, actually live with us in person, monitoring your comments and questions online. She's Caitlin Williams. Hello, everyone, and happy Friday. And our special guest. He swings, he jives, he shakes all over like a jellyfish. He's the vice president of operations for Huntsville Utilities, Mike Counts. Hello. How are y'all? Let's get to today's hot topic. Beer. Ooh. Craft uh -huh. brewing has blown up in North Alabama in the past few years. And it's great. Lots of breweries all over the place. And who doesn't love a good beer? But have you ever gone to like a restaurant and you said you're going to have a beer and you say, well, I've never tried this one before. I'm going to try this one. And then they bring it and you drink it and you're like, oh, yeah, I've made a terrible decision here. And, you know, and, and you've been disappointed with the beer you got. I bring this up because today, the first Friday in August, is International Beer Day. Although I'm sure for many of you, Every day is International Beer Day, and on top of that, August is Water Quality Month, and that's why we have our special guest with us today, because not only is Mike the Vice President of Operations for the company, he is also part owner of a local brewery and knows his way around the brewing process. So let's get right to it. Now, you can't have beer without water, Correct. right? In fact, our friends at the American Water Works Association, AWWA.org, we'll give them a shout out. They, they sell shirts that say, no water, no beer. Right. No water, no coffee, no water, no wine, et cetera, et cetera. So is it safe to say that good water is the foundation of good beer? Yes, very much so. So uh, this is kind of the Bible to, to anybody that brews beer at home. Okay, and, and, and the, Mr. Palmer, who wrote this, he, he makes a good uh, analogy in there. Uh, beer and brewing is equal to food and cooking. So whatever your ingredients are is going to make your, your food better, right? If you have better meat, if you have better vegetables, your, your cooking process, your food's going to be better. So the, the process is the same way with beer. The better ingredients you have, the better beer you're going to make. Okay. And good water is foundational. So I remember, and of course on the panel, if you have anything, please you know chime in. I remember when I was growing up, and uh, in rural southeast Missouri, we had, uh, my parents had a water softener installed in the house. And I remember thinking, why do we need a water softener? That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. How can water be hard? So can you explain, what, what when we talk about hard water, what that means, and, and do you have to look out for stuff like that when you are brewing your beer? First of all, I'm an electrical engineer. Okay. I'm not a chemist. <laughs> I don't play one on TV. I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I, chemistry is not my favorite subject, but hard water is essential for beer. Really? The minerals and the stuff that's in the hard water uh, helps react with uh, the sugars and, and the yeast and that type of thing to make the beer better. Matter of fact, if you use water that doesn't have any, you have to add stuff to it. Oh, so I did not know that. So the hard water is good for making beer. Well, because I remember my family got me a, uh, I probably can't say the name of the company, but it was just kind of, it was a very bare bones, make your own beer kit, plastic barrel, and you put the water in it, and then you put the thing, and you let it sit. And they specifically said you needed to use, uh, it may have even said they needed to use distilled, distilled water. water. But that seems to kind of go against what, what you're saying yeah. I think, again, you can make beer with that water, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people use that water. They use, uh, what's the other, reverse osmosis mm -hmm. water. But they probably have to add something to the beer to give it that, that those minerals and put that back into it to make it, it react properly. I use regular old tap water. Really? Is I've made it, I yes, I, I've made it with spring water. I've made it with uh, distilled water, mm -hmm. and I make it with tap water. I can't tell a difference. Now, maybe a beer connoisseur can tell a difference. I could not tell a difference. Well, I would think maybe... What? But when you say regular tap water, you're talking the award-winning Huntsville Utilities. Of course. <laughs> the water that, that we make, that we produce, is, is great-tasting water. And it, it makes is. great beer. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I guess that's why they have so many breweries. Well, that makes it sense. Is. That makes sense. So so if, you're, if you are... Because there's all different kinds of beer. 
And so, excuse me, I'm drinking a soda here. Um, if you're going to make a specific type of beer, you say, okay, well, if I'm making this type of beer, I should use tap water, or I'm going for a specific type of taste, so maybe I'll use spring water. Or So does that go, kind of go into it? It does, and he talks about that some in this book, that there are some breweries that use specific waters for specific types of beer. I've not made all of them, but I made several different ones, and I use the same water, and they'd still come out okay. But there are some flavorings that you can add to the water for different types of beers. There is. And, and how much, if you were just going to make a standard size batch of beer, how many, how many bottles, how many... Uh, yeah. How many gallons of beer so, is that going to make? So typically I make five-gallon batches. Okay. That's kind of the standard in the home brewing industry mm -hmm. is five-gallon batches. And, and depending on your grain content, how much grain you use, some, you know, five or six pounds of grain, some maybe 16 pounds of grain to make that five-gallon batch. The more grain you have, the more water you'll need because ah. the grain soaks that water up you know, even though you lift the grain out during the mashing process and let it drain, you can't get all that water out. And you don't want to press it or anything. You want it to just naturally flow out. So you'll lose a lot of water in that process. You'll also, part of it is boiling. So you lose water when you, you boil, of course. So how much, what's like the, for a five gallon batch of beer, what's the maximum amount of water you might need? You know, eight to ten pounds. I mean, eight to ten gallons. Sorry, <laughs> not pounds, gallons. Eight to ten gallons is kind of typical okay. what you would use. All right. Some may be a little bit more, some may be a little bit less, but about eight to ten gallons. So, if if you were going to use just regular tap water, like we were saying a second ago, um, is, is there anything you would need to do to prep the water beforehand, or you just put it in the in the the thing? I'm I'm trying not to yeah. use the technical terms because I don't know them. The big the thing. Pot. The pot. Okay. Yes. okay. Anything you need to do before you put it in there yeah. and toss in the fixes. Well, anything you do, anytime before you make beer, the key to making beer is sanitizing and cleaning everything. Uh -huh. So you have to sanitize everything you use. And then you just add the water to it. But you've got to make sure it's sanitized. If it's not sanitized, then things can grow in it. Right. So you, you've got to sanitize that first. But you no, know, the water that I use, it comes straight out of the tap. Most of utilities is award winning water, straight from the tap into the mash to make the mash. And how long did, oh, go ahead, you were going to say This might be a strange question, but do you have to use any particular sanitizers? Because I know some leave behind a residue, so mm -hmm. I didn't know. The, the, of course, they make plenty of sanitizers for beer makers, of mm -hmm. course. And, uh, so, yeah, so you can buy that and, and use it, but you can use just standard O Clorox, chlorine. Okay. It, you have to do a little bit because it takes a little bit longer, and you do have maybe some residual that will be there. So you may have to rinse it or something like that, but you, it takes a little bit longer with the, with some of the pots. But the best thing to use is stuff that's made for beer making. It doesn't leave any residuals. It doesn't affect any of the process. Okay. So now does the, the amount of water you use, does it have any kind of impact on the final alcohol amount? Yes, yes. There's certain amounts you gotta, you gotta make sure that you have, if you put too much water, you'll dilute it like anything else. You put too much water in your soda, it's going to dilute it. So right. yes. So what we do is a lot of times we'll make it and 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 we'll get it like four gallons or so, and we'll look at it. We'll we'll check the specific gravity of it. If it's uh, high, we'll we'll add some water to it till we get it to what we want it to be. And from start to finish for a five gallon batch, mm -hmm. how much time are you investing? It's, it's about six hours. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's, it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. then wait. Right. Mm -hmm. Work, then wait. So, But the whole process, six hours, that's from cleaning, getting everything ready, sanitized, to actually cleaning everything afterwards as well. So but it's about six hour process. And, and how much wait time in all that? Well, you, you're typically mashing lasts about an hour. Mm -hmm. So you're putting it at a certain temperature and let it sit in that hot water for an hour. You're pulling it out then you boil on it for another hour. Mm -hmm. So all that process, now you're adding stuff maybe during the process, mm -hmm. but it's add something, stir it, that wait again. So. But it's not like, okay, put it in the thing and now set it aside and come back in a month and, no. okay. Well, no, that, that happens after you finish all that. You put ah. it in a fermenter and let it sit right. in there for two weeks. Okay, yes. okay. So um, 
Let, let's talk about water quality. Okay. So we touched on that a little bit. Every year, uh, we post what's called the water quality report uh, on our website. The most recent one is there now. You can go check that out. It's if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a link to it. Um, if someone goes and looks at that, what kind of information are they going to find that is of interest to them? Because there's a lot of technical stuff in there as well. But to the average water consumer, what are they going to see that, that would interest them? And we just happen to have a right copy of that. I, I don't know why, but I just <laughs> happen to have it. Yeah, it, it's very good. It, it tells a lot about Huntsman Utilities water in general. And it, it tells a lot about what the EPA and ADM and stuff like that requires us to do. Um, it's a lot of information in here, a lot of chemistry again and stuff. But there, there is some useful information about Huntsman Utilities in general. What we do uh, as far as testing and, and how we test. And the one thing I found very uh, interesting was that, you know, we take 150 samples of water every month. A minimum of 150. Right. So that's 1,800 samples that we take a year of, of people's water out in the field just to just check it to make sure it's good and you know and it doesn't talk about that in here but in addition to that all our operators run the plants and stuff like that they're taking hourly samples of that water constantly make sure the pH is right chlorine levels are right and everything associated with clean water and th that's what they're checking so it's it's very interesting if you're a chemist that's probably very good reading uh, if you're an electrical engineer, it's still okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's electrical engineer, you should go back to brewing the beer. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea that they did that many tests. I mean, that's a lot of tests. It's, yeah. Yes, we have two full-time chemists, and uh, they're constantly testing water, and that's good. That's good for all of us. Keeps yeah. us safe. You know, I, I, I used to, and every place, depending on what your water source is, of course the primary source for us is the Tennessee River, depending on where your city gets water, there's different things they have to do. And I only mention that because um, I moved from southeast Missouri in a, from a city uh, right on the Mississippi River, which they drew a lot of water from, which you'd think that makes me pretty much immune to everything if I'm drinking out of the Mississippi River, um, that uh, went to Arizona. And I don't know where they exactly get their water, but they treat it in a much different way. And I drink a lot of water every day. And so my wife and I, before we move out there, we go out there to go house hunting. I get up in the morning. I have a big glass of water. Within an hour, I was violently ill and eventually figured out there's some sort of enzyme that they add to the water out there that, that they do for whatever reason. And some people have a very bad reaction to it and so we had to filter all our water uh, before I could drink it. That's my story about uh, about water. Uh, oh okay there are miles and miles and miles of water mains underground in the city. I don't know how many miles but I'm sure it's a lot. Um, it doesn't happen often but from time to time due to maybe some construction or ground shifting or something like that one of those mains might start to leak a little bit. So if someone out there suspects there is a water leak in their neighborhood or, or close to their home, well, how can they tell, for one thing, what should they be looking for, and what should they do? Yes, that's a good question. Of course, you'll typically we'll see the water on the ground. Mm -hmm. you know, you'll see it in maybe a curb and gutter where it's normally dry, and all of a sudden there's water there. That's typically a sign that you know, something, something's going on. And it could be on the customer side, it could be on our side. But uh, if you suspect one, call us. Uh, that the 535-1448 is the number. And we have people that they do leak survey and they go out and check to see if this is a leak that is ours or if there's something else going on. But they'll try to, they can test that water for chlorine first of all. That's the perfect test. If it's just regular groundwater, it won't have any chlorine in it. So they'll test it for the chlorine that says, okay, it is from us. Okay, is it ours or is it the customer sprinkler? Or is it the customer service line? But we can check that and we can let the customer know. And they can also, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, can't they also test it for fluoride and see if fluoride is in it? Probably, but <laughs> I, I'm an electrical engineer. Yes. I, <laughs> well, because I remember uh, Jessica, who works on our water department, when she does Ed Days, Jessica is a leak detector. Yes. And she mentioned that. Yes. So. Probably so. I think the easiest thing is the chlorine test. And yeah. so, but yes. 
Before we move on to, uh, to the next part, it's time for a new segment in our show where we check in on your comments, your questions, your observations, and see if we got anything wrong. And for that, we go to Caitlin. What you got for us, Caitlin? So only a couple of comments. Uh, um, we have about 13 people watching right now, so hello to everyone. <laughs> Um, Janice said to you, good job, Mike Counts. <laughs> um, and then Clint said, hashtag 256 Brewers. So shout out to all of the brewers in the 256 area. Way to wrap the 256. Um, and then one more time, what was a number that people could call if they had a leak? 256-535-4448. That's it. our general number, same way for a power outage, a gas problem, or anything like that. That's that number. Two five six five three light. There you go. There is a but different number for water quality. If you got a water quality concern, if your water, if you think your water is dirty or has an unusual odor or something like that, you can call our water quality lab, and one of our chemists, the smart guys <laughs> and girls, will be more than happy to check that out. But there's a, you want that? Would you like that number? Yes, please. Sure, why not? Okay, water quality lab two five six six five zero. Oh, Six three seven four, and we'll add all that to the comments at the end. We will. Well, you will. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say that was a collective <laughs> we, but really not. <laughs> <No. laughs> and then there was one more comment that was just added by Ryan. He said, "Good water to brew with." So thank you, Ryan. We appreciate that, and we are glad that we can serve you with good water. And now it's time for a new segment on the show called the Lightning Round, where we talk about things that have happened this week. Here's issue one. The top post of the week, and it deals with electricity, so it's a good thing you're here. Thursday morning, and Caitlin knows this all too well because she was on call this week, we had a power outage in Madison and the western part of the county. And it was actually kind of a fairly large outage because, and again, if, if I'm misunderstanding something here, correct, uh, please correct me, um, a lightning arrestor uh, failed in what was essentially one of the larger substations that feeds other substations. And so that's... Uh, is that basically what yeah, you can explain? It was, that. it was in our jet port substation, and lightning arresters are on both sides of the transformer. It has to protect the transformer. Mm -hmm. Those are half million dollar pieces of equipment, so you want wow. protection on them. Yes. So that's what its job was, and unfortunately, those things fail sometimes, um, and sometimes violently. Uh, but uh, they were able to cut that in the clear and get the power back on. But yes, those things unfortunately and, happen. And is jet port one of those? Uh, uh, substations that it's actually receiving power oh, from TVA right. and then distributing. So that's why, that's right. yeah, if something happens in one of those larger substations, it, it, it might be a slightly larger because then the other substations aren't getting their power. It's like a domino effect. That's so, right. but uh, uh, hats off to our crews who were out there in the middle of the night uh, getting that taken care of. Uh, they, they earned their pay this week because that's, that's a hard job. And you just don't realize it until you see those guys doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Climbing up the poles or up in the bucket. And if you ever get a chance to go up in the bucket truck, do it because it's a lot of fun. Caitlin mm -hmm. still hasn't gone up in one. we got to take care of that. I would love to do that. And especially bad weather. It oh, doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Was they're it out there working. It wasn't rain. But they're out there working 24-7. Yeah. And rain, it's a dangerous job. Rain or it's shine, a very dangerous hot job. Hot or cold. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And they're hugely competitive on their speed. While they're out there, man, yeah. <laughs> if you're not... <laughs> Yeah, they, 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 they take a lot of pride in that, as they should. And if you ever get a chance to go to a line worker's rodeo, which we had one here in Huntsville a couple years, couple ago. years ago. It was my first year working here, and that was really cool to watch. They, they have a, a, a one where they go up the pole, and then they have to take an egg and put the egg in their mouth and then come back down the pole without breaking the egg. And right. it's timed. Yeah. And it's really cool. And, there's, and they, of course, they're marking to make sure they follow safety precautions. But anyway, that's really cool. Um, the most not the most popular non-power outage related post was the update on Hurricane. Does anybody know how to pronounce it? Is I say it's, it's, it's not Isaias. Um, it's I A S. The hurricane. And I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing. I'm sorry about that. Because uh, as it moved up, uh, there were just over three million people without power uh, from North Carolina all the way up to Maine. Um, when that uh, when that hit. Now, as of this morning, I checked it, and that number's down to about one million. So they're making progress there. A lot of utility companies from that general area responded to help 
uh, restore power. And we get asked from time to time when there's a big outage in another part of the country, uh, and we have sent crews to that, uh, but we don't always send crews. And some people say, well, why did you send it to this one and why did you send it to that one? But there's a very there's a process in place for determining that. Can you kind of help explain well, that? Well, I mean, we, of course, we, we're going to take care of our customers first. So we're going to see what we've got going on. Can we allow those crews to go and help, which we want to help because we want them to help us. Right. We have a, a major issue like we did in which the tornadoes. Happened, yeah. In the tornadoes, yeah, in 2011. So we try to be able to help whenever we can. Sometimes we can't. We've just got too much going on. Like right now, there's just so much work in the Huntsville Madison County area with all the building that's going on. If we were asked, I don't think we could. Well, and that's part of it too. We have to be asked. We can't just yes, say, "Hey, we're going to go no. to New Jersey and help restore power." There's yeah. a process that that's right. because FEMA gets involved and uh, the American Pal Public Power Association sometimes helps. We call it mutual aid. Yeah. And documents so, have yeah, to be it signed be documented. between the two utilities so, and payment and blah blah blah. Yeah. So uh, well, the the whole process starts with having to be asked, and I don't, I, to my knowledge, we weren't even asked this time. So, but they're getting the job getting the job done out there, and uh, and that's great. Ordinarily, during the lightning round, we would bring up a, a important thing that happened on this day of his, in history. We talked about Jimmy Hoffa last week, and we still haven't found him. Um, but we don't have anything, so we want to mention that yesterday we posted two open positions. Uh, one is utility worker in the water department, and one is one is not. I can't remember uh, right. what it is. Um, but they are on our website and on our Facebook page, and we are accepting applications, and this is a fun place to work. We have a lot of fun here, so check those out. Um, so let's move on to shout outs and promotions, which is a new segment on the show, and it's basically our blatant attempt to increase our engagement. Amanda, anyone you want to give a shout out to, an organization, you want to promote anything? Always my mom. Hi, mom. Okay. <laughs> Has your mom got a lot of followers on social media? So when we tag her, people will see that? Uh, she's a yoga instructor. Okay. Let's try a little harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, what you got for us? Um, so I do want to give a shout out. So in so that Thursday night in the outage, I saw a lot of comments from people that said they woke up because their fan quit working because they have to sleep with a fan. And I mm. sympathize with them because I have to sleep with a fan too. Um, so the small shout out to all of you guys. I understand. I sympathize. So I'm glad we're able to get your fans back up and running. Um, but there is a nonprofit that I want to give a shout out to. It's Lincoln Village Ministry. Um, they actually bought the Lincoln School, reopened it um, for that area, and are completely reviving that section of town. They're actually buying homes, renovating them, and renting them out to the parents of the kids that are in their school. Um, wonderful nonprofit, many ways for people to get involved. Um, so I highly encourage you to check it out um, if you want to tutor kids, if you want to help them with maintenance or any kind of projects they have around the school. I'm sure they'd be happy to have y'all. Um, so yeah, great organization. Look them up, learn more about them. Yeah, Lincoln Village Ministry. Anybody you want to give a shout out to or, or anything you want to promote? Clint mentioned it on Facebook, 256 Brewers. That's the group that, that I'm a part of. There's a couple here in town, but that's a good group. Uh, if anybody's interested in learning how to brew beer, contact 256 Brewers. Uh, I believe you can check the website and Google it or whatever, but that's a good group. They, they There's no competition between you. We're all helping each other. Well, there's competition, but <laughs> uh, we all help each it's other. It's friendly competition. It's friendly competition, and it's all about having a good time and brewing good beer. Okay, and we want to let all you sports fans know out there that our Senior Vice President of Customer Care, John Olszewski, is going to be on 97.7 the ESPN Radio The Zone tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock to talk about college football in general and specifically his alma mater, the Citadel. So if you are a Citadel fan or a college football fan, or if you know John, you'll want to tune in for that. Um, and we close with uh, a little bit of sad news. Wilford Brimley, great character actor, passed away uh, this week. Uh, basically stole every scene he was in. And before he was an actor, he was Howard Hughes' bodyguard. A lot of people didn't know that, but that, that's a true fact. But what even fewer people know about Mr. Brimley is that he loved to sing. He loved to sing uh, lounge songs and Sinatra type pieces. And, and when that may seem kind of odd when you first think about it, when you envision this tough guy actor, uh, but he, he enjoyed it so much, he even recorded an album. This is the honest truth. He recorded an album with Wilford Brimley with the Jeff Hamilton Trio. And uh, he never thought of himself as a great singer. It's just something he did because he enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, the thought of him being a lounge singer might make a lot of people laugh, but I kind of think, I really don't think he cared 
Um, it was just something he loved to do, and perhaps that's the lesson we should all take away from this man's very well-lived life, is if there's something you enjoy doing, don't worry about what other people think, uh, just do it. So if you get a chance, go online and Google Wilford Brimley and the Jeff Hamilton Trio, um, and you're going to be surprised at what you hear. It's a very enjoyable to hear the man sing. So that's the shout out I want to give today. That's it for our show today. Thanks for our, to our guests, Amanda, Caitlin, and especially our special guest, Mike Counts. Remember, all guests on Facebook Live Friday receive a year's supply of turtle wax and rice aroni. Rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Todd reminding you that you can't spell utilities without you. <laughs>